year 429 BCE, a plague struck the city of Athens. The historian Thucydides, who caught the plague but survived, has given us a vivid description of this famous episode in the history of ancient Greece. He recounts the symptoms of the disease in gruesome detail and the desperation that took hold in the city. As the enemy Spartans ravaged the surrounding countryside, people flooded into Athens, taking refuge behind the walls and hastening the spread of the plague. Confronted by an affliction that struck people from all walks of life with suddenness and impunity, some people gave up all hope and abandoned themselves to pleasure and vice. Others stuck by infected loved ones, friends, and strangers, even knowing that those who cared for the afflicted were particularly vulnerable. And eventually, care for the sick fell to those who'd survived and therefore gained immunity. The picture painted by Thucydides hits surprisingly close to home. What can we learn about our current situation by peering back into the ancient past? We're archaeologists, which means that we specialize in studying past societies by looking at the physical remains that they've left behind. We're also married, so we get to, or have to, depending on who you ask, uh, conduct a lot of our research together. When it comes down to it, what most archaeologists are really into is trash of one kind or another. The stuff that people left behind accidentally. Kate, for example, spent a weekend last fall combing through the contents of a 200-year-old outhouse in New Hampshire. Would you care to elaborate? Sure. I'm a zoo archaeologist, which means that I study animal bones as a way of learning more about past societies. This particular privy on the campus at Dartmouth College yielded animal bones from meals, like a leg of lamb and a whole fish, along with a dead kitten, a gold ring, and a set of false teeth, among other rubbish. But this was just a side project. What Tate and I both specialize in are the societies of the ancient Middle East and Mediterranean, especially Mesopotamia, Egypt, and the island of Cyprus. We're both particularly interested in ancient cities, ancient political life, and the role of food and drink. Tate, for example, studies ancient agriculture and ancient beer, and together we've recently published studies about pigs and sheep in early Mesopotamia. The topic of disease is very much on everyone's mind these days. We'd like to dig down into this topic by focusing on how it intersects with our own work. As archaeologists who study the deep human past, we want to start by pointing out two things. First, people have been dealing with deadly, contagious diseases for thousands of years. As we just saw, if we step back into ancient Greece, or Rome, or Mesopotamia, we see clear evidence for diseases that are comparable to what we're dealing with today. But if we look at the full scope of human history, this period of time turns out to be just a blip, a tiny fraction of humanity's time on Earth. For the vast majority of the human past, our ancestors did not have to contend with the same range of diseases. And there are two key episodes that radically altered the trajectory of our relationship with disease. First, as the world emerged from the last ice age, some human groups started transitioning away from a highly mobile lifestyle and toward a sedentary one. That is, rather than moving across the landscape seasonally, they started settling down in year-round villages. Second, several thousand years later, we see the first moves toward much larger and much more densely occupied settlements, the first cities. Both of these episodes revolved around changes in the density and scale of human settlement and in the frequency of human-human and human-animal interactions. These are issues that resonate in our own world where we suddenly have to be very careful about contact with other people thanks to a disease that almost certainly originated in non-human animals. So let's dig down a little bit into these two transformative episodes. You've probably heard of hunter-gatherers, that is, people who make a living by hunting animals, fishing, gathering plants, etc. This is a lifestyle with very deep roots, stretching back hundreds of thousands of years. And there are plenty of hunter-gatherers in our own world today. It was once common to talk about these modern-day hunter-gatherers as survivals from the past, as if we could look at them and see how our ancestors used to live. It's now clear that there are major problems with this view, and anthropologists have been fighting against it for decades. The same goes for the idea that hunting and gathering applies a passive approach to the world and a life of desperation, wandering here and there at the mercy of a fickle nature. To the contrary, we now know that this lifestyle often requires incredibly detailed ecological knowledge, sophisticated forms of long-range planning, active modification of the environment, and complex forms of social organization. At the same time, a hunting and gathering lifestyle often, but not always, requires mobility, that is, a willingness to move around the landscape, rather than staying put in one place year-round. And hunter-gatherers tend to live in small groups, although they often come together periodically for larger social gatherings. In fact, between about 10,000 and 8,000 BCE, 
hunter-gatherers were constructing massive ritual structures where they came together in large groups to hold huge feasts. At the site of Göbekli Tepe in Turkey, for example, at least 20 huge, circular, stone structures were elaborately decorated with carvings of wild animals and were filled to the brim with animal bones. Alongside these remnants of large-scale feasting, archaeologists uncovered tentative evidence for the world's earliest known beer. Tate always wants to bring any discussion back around to beer. Let's get back to the topic of disease. From the origin of our species around 300,000 years ago until about 10,000 years ago, all of our ancestors were mobile hunter-gatherers. Most evidence suggests a low incidence of infectious disease among hunter-gatherers, but that doesn't mean that disease was unknown. Archaeologists and anthropologists have two main ways of exploring disease in ancient populations. Bone damage, caused by disease, and genetic evidence, either from human skeletons or from the genomes of the diseases themselves. Early Homo sapiens skeletons show a pretty high incidence of inherited skeletal abnormalities. For example, a recent study of 66 early human skeletons found extensive evidence including elongated and curving limb bones, teeth that had fused together, and other irregular bone features. This evidence for inherited disease isn't surprising. Populations were low, so inbreeding was high. When it comes to infectious diseases, genetic evidence suggests that bacterial infections like tuberculosis and typhoid were present, as were some viral infections like herpes and hepatitis. So infectious diseases were around, but their ability to spread rapidly across the population and cause big problems was muted among dispersed and mobile groups of hunter-gatherers. Homo sapiens continued their hunting and gathering ways relatively unchanged until about 10,000 years ago, when the last ice age ended and many areas became wetter, warmer, and thus more hospitable. This is when some human populations in Israel, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon, we call them the Natufians, started settling down in permanent villages. We used to think that these earliest villages would only have been possible with the benefit of agriculture, but it's now clear that the Natufians were hunter-gatherers. They gathered seeds from rich stands of wild barley. They hunted migrating wild animals. They stored up food in underground pits. They buried their dead under the floors of their houses, and they began to accumulate a lot more goods. It's hard to accumulate stuff if you're constantly moving from place to place. So for the first time in human history, People were living together in year-round villages, and not just in small family groups. If we move forward a bit in time, into what's known as the Neolithic period, we see both much larger and much denser villages. One of the most famous of these villages, Çatalhöyük in Turkey, was incredibly dense. So dense that there weren't any streets whatsoever. The houses were packed right up against one another, and were accessed through holes in the roof. To get around the village, you had to walk across the roofs of your neighbor's houses. It was during this Neolithic period that some groups began actively producing their own food. That is, they began cultivating crops and raising animals. When it comes to early agriculture, the key concept is domestication. As humans began interacting more closely with certain plants and animals, they changed the selective pressures operating on those species, resulting in significant evolutionary change. Let me illustrate this with a quick look at animal domestication. Despite the great diversity of animals on the planet, very few species have ever been domesticated. The ones that have, at least the mammals, tend to share a series of behavioral traits. They have a strong social hierarchy, they like to hang out in groups, and they will eat in close proximity to other animals. So what happens to animals that have been domesticated? As a general rule, they get smaller, stupider, and more docile. And these are changes that we can see reflected in animal bones from archaeological sites. For example, we can easily see changes in body size. Sometimes the bones of domesticated animals can be as much as 50% smaller than the bones of their wild ancestors. And some bones change shape entirely. For example, the horns of wild goats curve backwards from the top of their head in a straight line, while the horns of domesticated goats twist out sideways from the top of their head. If you're interested in this kind of thing, I teach a course called Zoo Archaeology, in which we learn hands-on how to identify, analyze, and interpret archaeologically recovered animal bones. And I teach a course called History of Agriculture that begins with the earliest experiments in domestication and brings us all the way up to the present day. What we want to emphasize here, though, is the new kind of multi-species communities that emerged when humans started settling down in villages and domesticating plants and animals. Neolithic villages brought humans together with other humans, animals, plants, and microbes in new settings that encouraged much closer and more frequent interactions. One effect of this lifestyle transformation was a ramping up of disease among humans, especially animal-derived or zoonotic diseases like measles and whooping cough. 
It's important to point out, though, that this was not a one-way street. Evidence increasingly shows that diseases like tuberculosis could be passed back and forth between humans and their new animal friends. So we've talked about the first episode of Transformation that took us from a human world occupied solely by mobile hunter-gatherers and into a Neolithic world of agricultural villages, giving us a whole new set of diseases to contend with. Now let's talk about the second episode. For this, we need to fast forward to about 4000 BCE, when the world's first cities emerged in Mesopotamia, in modern-day Iraq and Syria. These first cities were a far cry from earlier settlements that had maxed out at about 2,000 people. Populations in these new cities could reach 10,000, 20,000, and in some cases, as many as 200,000 people. So these cities were orders of magnitude larger than anything that had come before, and they were incredibly dense. Houses were packed right up against one another, streets were narrow, there were few open spaces, so lots and lots of people were living together in extremely close quarters. The urban skyline was dominated by huge temples with stepped platforms known as ziggurats that stretched up toward heaven. Large chunks of the urban landscape were given over to the walled-off compounds that surrounded these temples and to equally extravagant royal palaces. The two of us spent five years excavating the remains of one of these early cities at the site of Hamukar in northeastern Syria. Tate's excavations uncovered a city street lined on each side with buildings. Buildings that had been destroyed in a huge fire and then abandoned. In fact, the entire city appears to have been destroyed, abandoned, and then not reoccupied for centuries. My excavations were focused on the longer-term development of the city, from urbanization through destruction. The city started out as a relatively dispersed collection of residential compounds. Over a period of 200 years, the space between these compounds filled in, resulting in a much denser urban landscape. My excavations produced some pretty phenomenal finds, including a neighborhood brewery and a cylinder seal, kind of like the seals that used to be stamped in wax on the back of envelopes. The erotic scene incised on the seal showed a stick figure man and woman having sex while the woman drank beer through a straw. As oddly specific as this sounds, this was actually a really common scene in Mesopotamian art. And now I'm the one talking about beer. Yeah, let's get back on topic. These cities offered residents a totally new kind of living experience. They were busy, crowded, lively, and dynamic places. This is where the world's first writing was invented. The cuneiform writing system was first used to record economic transactions, but over time it spawned a much more diverse literature. Epic poems, songs, histories, law codes, legal documents, letters, religious hymns, medical texts, you name it. Perhaps you've read some of the more famous compositions, like the Epic of Gilgamesh or the Code of Hammurabi. In these cities, people were no longer living in face-to-face -face communities where everyone knew everyone and everyone's business. You do, however, see the emergence of strong neighborhood identities and efforts to maintain smaller-scale communities within the city. For example, people like to hang out in neighborhood taverns. Indeed, beer was all over the place in these cities. People loved this fermented microbial product. The work of transforming barley into an alcoholic beverage is accomplished in part by humans, but really by yeast that consume sugar and excrete alcohol. We're focusing today on the negative impacts of human-microbe interaction, but the people of Mesopotamia were also partnering with microbes to create their favorite beverage. Since 2012, I've been involved in an effort to recreate the beers of Mesopotamia, and I'm currently writing a book about Mesopotamian beer. We've given you a link to a short webinar that I did on the subject if you're interested. We also recently wrote an article about the role of pigs in early Mesopotamian cities. We argued that pigs were ideally suited to the new urban environment, and it looks like many people within these cities were raising pigs in their homes. For households that increasingly found themselves under the thumb of an emerging centralized government, one that was apparently not interested in pigs, pigs might have allowed them to maintain some level of economic independence. The loss of autonomy was just one of the issues that emerged in these new urban environments. Inequality was on the rise. Slavery was increasingly common, and warfare was a regular part of life. There were issues with sanitation. Home interiors were kept scrupulously clean, but many public spaces were not, with rubbish thrown out in the streets, rudimentary sewer systems, and an unsanitary water supply. Diseases were common in these dense and dirty environments, and there's an extensive Mesopotamian medical literature dedicated to diseases, their symptoms, and how to treat them. And they certainly understood the infectious nature of some diseases. In the 18th century BCE, a king named Zimri Lim wrote a letter to his wife, Shibtu, instructing her on how to deal with a sick and infectious courtier, possibly suffering from leprosy. Another letter recommends fumigation and quarantine for a sick man. And one text predicts, 
there will be a serious epidemic, and consequently, one person will not enter another person's house. Sound familiar? We don't really have much evidence for massive, pandemic-style outbreaks in Mesopotamia, but we do from nearby regions. For example, a Hittite king named Murshili II, who ruled much of what is today Turkey, wrote a series of prayers asking the gods to ease a pandemic that had raged in his country for years. Morshili suspected the disease had come from Egyptian soldiers, captured in war and brought to his kingdom as slaves. You'll have a chance to look at some other ancient disease outbreaks in your supplementary activities. If you're interested in these ancient societies more generally, I teach courses on the history of Mesopotamia, Egypt, Greece, and Rome, and Kate teaches courses on the archaeology of Egypt and Mesopotamia, as well as an introduction to global prehistory. Okay, as we've seen, the transformations that took humans from mobile to sedentary lifestyles and from small settlements to massive cities opened the door to new types and levels of disease. But we want to emphasize that this particular pathway of human development was neither inevitable nor universal. Our current archaeological project on the Mediterranean island of Cyprus is exploring a society that seems to have opted for an alternative path. Surrounded by areas like Mesopotamia that were seeing rapid urbanization and rising inequality, the inhabitants of Cyprus maintained an egalitarian, village-based society for another 1,500 years. This seems to have been a conscious effort to prevent the accumulation of wealth, power, or authority. To explore this, we're excavating a small, prehistoric village on the beautiful northwest coast of the island. Each summer we lead a study abroad program where we take about 20 NC State students with us to excavate, we all live and work together for five intense weeks of hands-on learning, waking up at 4.30 in the morning, spending our days out in the hot sun, uncovering 5,000-year-old houses, pottery, stone figurines, even an ancient copper smelting furnace. Also visiting archaeological sites across the island, and of course, getting some well-deserved relaxation at the local beach. It's a lot of fun. We both started our archaeological careers on similar undergraduate field schools in Cyprus and came away with lifelong friends. If you're interested, please think about coming to join us. You're going to be hearing from a lot of different specialists over the coming weeks, so we thought we'd finish up with a couple of thoughts about what archaeology contributes to the broader discussion. First, archaeology helps us to understand how we got to where we are. That is, it lets us follow the complex series of historical developments, reaching back many thousands of years into the past, that's given shape to our present world. And second, archaeology highlights the great diversity of ways of being human. In this light, the archaeological past becomes a vast collection of resources for thinking about what's possible and how to make our future what we want it to be. Thanks very much. Thanks. <laughs>